Um, so I'm happy today to talk about, um, I, I decided that having these three different topics um, may be too much for an eight minute talk. So I kind of decided that I'd focus on one of the things that we've been recently doing on um, specifically on personalized Alzheimer's disease detection problem. So looking to use AI here um, to solve some of the more challenging issues. <clears throat> so um, this slide here is basically something that gives you a kind of idea about how big this problem is in terms of human costs, in terms of personnel costs, in terms of actual economic costs, um, and even um, the cost of people that are taking care of Alzheimer's patients and their own emotional and other health um, costs. So very quickly, in Snapchat, and all of these were um, gathered from the Alzheimer's disease um, website called ALZ.org. <clears throat> we have one in 10 people over 65 that are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Every 66, 66 seconds, someone develops this disease. One in three die. Um, because of it, and we are looking something like 1.1 trillion by 2050 for these costs. So this is just a just a just a way to demonstrate the magnitude of this problem. <clears throat> so um, the traditional methods to diagnose Alzheimer's um, have been on the left hand side, top corner of the screen. You can see that um, they are called general traditional biomarkers. Um, and they are typically MRI scans, uh, PET, PET scans, and then looking for proteins in cerebrospinal fluids, and so on and so forth. Those, those sets of uh, biomarkers tend to be invasive and very, very expensive. Um, the fMRI scan alone um, costs something, one fMRI scan alone costs something like $5,000 to $7,000. And if you want to continually monitor a patient, that's going to be several thousand dollars over periods of years. It's just not, this is not really something that's scalable in that, in that way. Um, the other means that are currently being used that are not as invasive are what's called cognitive and memory tests. Um, they take on the forms of digital ordering. So basically uh, you give a patient or, 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 the, or, or the individual um, a bunch of numbers. You ask them to order it in, a, in the order of increasing um, numbers or something like that. You give them a bunch of verbal um, questions and you ask how they answer. Usually this is done in the primary care physician's um, um, practice and that tends to be not very um, accurate in determining uh, <clears throat> Alzheimer's. <clears throat> there was another um, test which is now very widely used and that's described by this picture here. So the patient or the non-patient, the control, is given this picture and asked to describe this, whatever they see. So um, um, Optima and Dementia Bank are two uh, very well-known um, data sets that has basically uh, taken all these picture descriptions between controls and individuals and created a database there, um, classifying this as a control individual or a, or a person with mild cognitive impairment or a person with advanced um, disease. So these things is where most of today's NLP-based uh, techniques fall. So how can we use this kind of picture description tests to um, tell whether a person has Alzheimer's or not? Now, our goal here was to develop something uh, that is non-intrusive and which is a cognitive assessment tool in the sense that it can tell you whether a person is beginning to develop uh, Alzheimer's or not. Um, using just the language expressions that indicate these patterns of attention, perception, logical structurization, and so on. And in practice, we hope that we can put it on one of these kind of devices, an Alexa or a, or a phone or whatever. <coughs> uh, and the reason why we do that is when we went to um, a, uh, we actually sat through uh, a doctor who's working with Alzheimer's patients. And when we, we saw him interview one person who was obviously uh, diagnosed as having Alzheimer's, and we could see the amount of pressure and anxiety that that um, patient had while talking to him. She just did not want to be there. So all this all this um, uh, stigma that's associated with it also plays upon um, a part in people not wanting to take these tests, which makes it harder to diagnose them early. 
So this makes a case for us having these things to be running unobtrusively behind them. <coughs> so <coughs> we not only wanted to do that, but we also wanted to develop a solution that will provide an easy way to visualize for a lay person as well as a general practitioner, um, whether a person is developing this Alzheimer's disease or not. And then we wanted to demonstrate that uh, linguistic biomarkers are actually a promising approach for this kind of uh, visualization. And then we identify key linguistic biomarkers. Uh, we used the uh, data set that was basically 10 years uh, speech data from uh, President Ronald Reagan. And then we ran this test on that to see if we can find when potentially he had uh, started to develop this disease. So this is a different kind of approach than what other people normally take, which is um, based on the, the uh, picture description test. Picture description test is about a population, uh, which gives you a way of telling whether a person has dementia or not. This one, uh, an approach like this, will demonstrate how you can develop a personalized uh, tool that can um, keep track of that person's unique capabilities and that person's unique style and how it changes and using just that, figure out whether or not this person has Alzheimer's. <clears throat> so it, it, it lets us make it highly personalized um, to the individual. So um, here are the, here's a little bit about the data set on the left hand side. Uh, we gathered um, speeches from 1980 to 1989 and the right hand side column uh, just tells you how many of these features we had. Um, we extracted a bunch of um, features from these features. One of them is called the POS or the parts of speech features. Things like number of pronouns the, uh, the person is using, the ratio of nouns versus pronouns, and a whole bunch of other things. So just to intuit why this would be uh, necessary. Um, People who start to develop uh, Alzheimer's disease start to use more pronouns rather than proper nouns or actual nouns. Uh, so these kind of things can be indicators. So I'm going to speed up a little bit here. We also measure vocabulary richness. There is a whole bunch of measures developed in NLP. Um, there are things called readability measures, which gives you an idea of how uh, sophisticated a person's language is and so on and so forth. And then the first thing we did was obtain what's called a correlation matrix of these uh, linguistic features. So this is a heat map here on the right hand side that gives you a bunch of these features and tells you how correlated they are. So if they are extremely correlated, you probably don't need to use the two of them. You just need to use one of them. Uh, if you just cut down on the amount of work you need to do or your machine learning AI uh, needs to do to uh, do your classification. <clears throat> Then we used a T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. It's called the T-SNE. Popularly, it's used um, to, uh, for dimensionality reduction. But in our case, uh, we use this to basically, our hypothesis is that in this highly multidimensional um, feature space, can we identify, uh, can we bring this down into two or three dimension and then start to see if there is a clustering out there, uh, which will indicate that um, some of these um, speeches or some of these data points are essentially anomalies. So here we have one such clustering in, in, in a two-dimensional space and here is the, um, um, on the right hand side bar graph, I don't know if you can see my cursor, I'm hoping you can. Um, the colors are basically uh, years, they indicate different years of speech and we start to see that some of these speeches move towards the end and they look very different and that's potentially where um, the pattern is changing. Um, so using this kind of um, approach, we can give somebody a very visual uh, way of telling a patient, look, this is where it's going. So we are beginning to think that, you know, maybe you should take more uh, um, advanced um, tests to evaluate your, um, evaluate your risk or so on and so forth. Now that can be done sort of, it's, um, Although it is, it is an AI-based technique, it, there is some uh, human intervention in that. And so in order to not do that, but to make it a little bit more automated, we tried out a couple more uh, ways of doing this. One is just a one class SVM and the other is an isolation forest. And here uh, we, we find the same things. So we can find these anomaly, the abnormal observations, they end up falling out in a certain way. 
uh, compared to the more normal patterns of speech for the um, user. Um, so over time, um, we, wh what we found from this set of data was that President Reagan started showing early signs of AD well before the official announcement in 94, probably sometime between 83 and 87. Um, over time, he started to show significant reduction in the number of unique words he was using and started to show a significant increase in conversational fillers and non-specific nouns. Uh, the proposed methods basically identify specific speeches that exhibit these linguistic markers for AD. So it's a great beginning and uh, we expect to build on this kind of research um, to look for other data sets and so on and so forth. So happy to take any questions. And I can stop sharing. Yeah, yeah uh, Suva, you can leave the screen on and the next speaker will be able to uh, load uh, the screen automatically. Uh, so I see one question coming in. Uh, okay, here's the question. Aren't Regan's speeches written by others and he yeah. simply delivers them? So you are? That is, that is a question. Uh, that was also something we uh, wanted to, we were wondering about, but then we hear that there is also a strong input from the person for whom the speech is being written. So it's not completely uh, somebody else's work. Um, and the second thing is that we have, um, we don't have enough data for any of these public figures who we know has been um, diagnosed uh, of a, with Alzheimer's disease that is completely non-controlled, you know, uh, non-scripted in any way. So it's kind of difficult to do that. And to get very specific patient-specific data, uh, we, we tried and that was that you need to actually run a clinical uh, test for that and so on and so forth. And that's a longer process and we need a bunch of other approvals and so on. But that's the next step, which is we were just looking for ways uh, to test our theory that this is actually possible. And we have a, we, what we are seeing is that we can collaborate some of the uh, older results um, that certain types of features are in fact, um, in, fact uh, in fact, very indicative of Alzheimer's disease in a person's speech. Okay, uh, just one more question because we're slightly behind. How can you distinguish AD from uh, dementia? Um, so for this, we have a different, we have been working on a completely different data set, the one we talked to you about before, which was the uh, picture description test. There you have um, label data sets that tell you mild cognitive uh, impairment, dementia, AD, vascular dementia, different types of dementia. So at that point, you use that label data set you make a multi-class um, classifier essentially and get your results basically through that. And we have shown in that, in that approach as well that some of the markers that we're looking at here were influential even in, the, in, even in that, uh, that data 